sell us uh, a lot of his meat. And we told him, uh, we, we, we hung up and we had this discussion and we called him back and we said, well, we'll buy your mink, but only if you sell us every single animal left on your farm. We, we said this under the pretense of you, you raise such good mink, even the mink that you're going to kill tomorrow, just sell them, we'll, we'll pay you the pelt price for them. And the reason we agreed to pay him money was because he wanted to get out of the business. He was done. He wanted to go back to school. And uh, he wasn't primarily a fur farmer. He was a wildlife biologist for the um, Montana Fish and Wildlife and Parks Department. So we rationalized that in this instance, it was OK for us to give him the $8,000 that he put on the price on his farm. And we bought out all, every single animal there. And one of the reasons why we did that is because we made a promise to those mink that we saw getting killed that day. And we told them that we would do everything humanly possible to destroy the industry that was destroying them because we had betrayed them. We had let them down. They looked at us. They looked inside me. They looked at my heart. They knew who I was. And they wondered why I didn't take action. So we took these 66 animals. There were 60 mink, four bobcats, and two Canadian lynx. And we moved them to Washington State. And over six months, we rehabilitated them. We had a Blackfoot medicine woman come and perform a ceremony of protection for them that would guide them back to their homeland when we, when we released them. And she told us, before we did this, each time, smudge the animals, burn some sage and sweet grass. Because as indigenous people, we use fire as a cleanser. We use it to clean ourselves of evil, of wrongdoing. And that is why I, as a member of the Animal Liberation Front, support arson as a tactic. Because there is no better use for an animal research laboratory than is kindling for a fire. There's no better use for a And one of the things that I learned at this time re rehabilitating these 66 animals was learning their individual personalities and characteristics. Each one of them behaved differently and had different traits. Now, because we were around them long enough, we began to notice. And I had this epiphany, and I just realized after I went to uh, uh, the Seattle Fur Exchange auction and was uh, under the premise of being a fur farmer again and pulling out bundles of pelts. I was in a warehouse of 1.6 million mink pelts. And I thought, if these 66 mink, or these 60 mink that I've gotten to know have this much personality and individual uh, just you know, acknowledgement of their own life, how can I not believe that those 1.6 million mink felt the exact same way? Of course they did. And I find that we fall into this trap of using statistics sometimes. And it's part of the process of dehumanization, desensitization, when we just rattle off numbers. I don't ever want to be referred to as one of 100,000. You know, I don't want my son to be referred that way. I don't want to see you people referred to that way. You know, we are individual people. You know, we all have the capabilities for love and compassion and respect and kindness. And when I saw what the fur industry had been doing to the Mink Nation, taking one of our wild nations of animals, imprisoning them, and essentially reducing them to another domestic livestock species, I knew that we had to do more. I had been a member of the ALF in the early 1980s, or the late 1980s, and uh, uh, was just in a hiatus when I did the undercover investigation. And at the completion of that investigation, at the completion of the rehabilitation process, I had amassed quite a thorough understanding of the fur farmer industry. I knew its weaknesses, I knew its strengths. I had been led into closed door sessions of the Fur Commission USA. They were uh, trying to recruit me as a spokesperson for the fur industry because they saw me as an indigenous person that they love to trot out. Just as much as the vivisection industry cues a human baby when they need to justify their torture, so does the fur industry you know, wheel out an indigenous person when they are under attack. How dare they? The fur industry is responsible for the genocide of our people. They were the foot soldiers of the invader. They introduced dis disease, gunpowder, prostitution, alcohol, the first chemical weapon to be used against our people, to this day still destroying our people. Who are they to say that they are helping us? So at the completion of the rehabilitation project, when the, the last bobcat to be released uh, 
was taken into the Kalmyopsis wilderness of southern Oregon. And when that animal left our sanctuary and the cages were all empty, I was there and I was with Linda, who was our key rehabilitator, and I just started crying. And I was, in a sense, relieved, but at the same time, I told her, now, at least when they were here, we could protect them. When those 66 animals were here, we could ensure that they had food and shelter and that nobody would harm them from the fur trade or otherwise. But when we took them and released them back into their homeland, we knew that that was animal liberation, which meant we no longer were part of the equation. They were returned to where they rightly belonged, and that was the end of the story. And I feared what they faced, because I knew that they still faced the litany of leg hole traps, of hunters, of uh, development, destruction of habitat, water pollution, heavy metals contamination, as mink are uh, high on the, the chain of showing heavy metal uh, residues in their flesh has been tested in the Great Lakes. And so we decided that we had to do everything we could as I had made that promise to those men to destroy that industry. And I knew we weren't going to do it with polite protests. I knew we weren't going to do it with petitions or letter writing. I knew we could only do it with the destruction of the property that mattered most to them. The destruction of the research that was being used to further domesticate and overcome the diseases encountered through domestication of meat. <coughs> I became aware of the Mink Farmer Research Foundation, which uh, is a trade industry group which um, funds themselves on a tax levied on every pellet sold through the auction house of one or two cents. This money goes into a fund and is distributed to researchers who are carrying out uh, experiments on behalf of the fur trade. Experiments that will help the fur industry maintain a low overhead so that they can survive in a, in a market where profit margins are being reduced by a demand for less of a demand in fur. It was the only saving grace that fur farmers in this country had was being able to raise a mink for the less than $14 that they got at the market for their pelt. So that same day that I cried at the rehabilitation facility, I climbed into my car and I drove down to Corvallis, Oregon, where the Oregon State University was, where the, uh, the fur breeder research facility, the largest fur breeder research facility in the nation existed. For 65 years, they had existed doing research for the fur farm industry without any, even as much as a protest against them. I climbed up on the roof of the building, uh, found there to be no security, and I reasoned that uh, what the best thing to do to this place was, was to destroy it. And I told myself, look, you just finished an undercover investigation of this fur farm industry, you've been writing about it, you did this rehabilitation project, you've been writing about that, you've been you know, your name is totally connected to fur farms. Everybody knows that you're, you know, the expert right now on fur farms. If there's an ALF campaign that targets the fur farm industry, it's not going to take a rocket scientist for them to figure out that I'm involved. And I remember those mink. And I told myself, what do I face? Four years in prison? Five years in prison? Ten years in prison? That's nothing compared to having my neck ring by a fur farmer. That's nothing compared to spending eight months of a miserable existence in a 10 inch wide cage. Mink are wild animals. And like all wild animals, the worst thing you can do to them is not physical pain, but physical restraint. To force an animal that normally travels five to 10 miles every night to live in a cage eight inches, 10 inches wide, as the mink farm industry does right here in Erie, Pennsylvania too. So I knew what we had to do. And I gathered a few warriors that I trusted and within 10 days, we struck Oregon State University's experimental fur farm. We started a fire in the experimental feed barn. That, uh, uh, their focus was the dietary uh, requirements of mink that was necessary to get a quality pelt while not costing too much money. And they were essentially developing the scientific diets that allowed mink to be, uh, or allowed the recessive genes that create uh, uh, the fur pelt uh, quality uh, to exist. And so we destroyed their experimental fur barn. We got into the main research laboratory and destroyed everything that we could within the hours that we were there. We confiscated uh, record books, address books, uh, Rolodexes, files on every single fur farm in the country, every single fur farm researcher in the country. We took that information with us. Within six uh, we, we, we hung up and we had this discussion and we called them back and we said, well, we'll buy your mink, but only if you sell us every single animal left on your farm. 
we, we 